All right, Acts chapter 17. We're going to jump back in, Acts 17 tonight in verse 16. Uh, we talked about last week where they came out of the uh, area of Berea, and we talked about the Bereans and all their, you know, uh, things that were going on in that, in that community and how God was using them, how they were studying the scriptures. They were looking to see if what Paul was telling them was true. Uh, and we talked about how important that is even for us. And then he leaves and there's either a three-day trip by sea or a two-week trip by land, but he comes to Athens. And this is a whole different ball game. Uh, we read this to close last week, but I want to read it again as we begin today. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was troubled within him. When he saw that the city was full of idols, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshiped God and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Then also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers argued with him. Some said, what is this pseudo-intellectual trying to say? That word pseudo-intellectual, we're going to go back to that in just a minute uh, and look at that. But that's an interesting uh, turn of phrase that they used. Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling them the good news of Jesus and the resurrection. Uh, they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. And they said, may we learn about this new teaching you're speaking of? For what you say sounds strange to us, and we want to know these, what these things mean. Uh, now all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Um, so Paul comes to town, and he has this deep sense of responsibility uh, when it came to getting the gospel to the nation. So whenever he came to a town, we've talked about this before, he goes straight to the synagogues. He knows the, the gospel is first for the Jews and then the Gentiles. And he also knows that the, gen, the, the Jews and God-fearing uh, Gentiles who are uh, trying to be part of the Jewish community know the Old Testament. And so what better way to show them Christ than to first root them in the Old Testament and then bring them up through this Jesus that is talked about. We mentioned Genesis 3.15 uh, he will bruise your head, you will bruise his heel. The gospel is presented there. And then we see Jesus throughout the Old Testament in the Torah. We see him in the law. We see representations of what Christ will do literally, figuratively uh, walked out through the sacrifices and the mercy seat and the temple, the Holy of Holies, the high priest, all those things. So he comes to Athens, and, and I, think, I think that he feels the weight of the lostness. It says his spirit was troubled within him. He feels the weight of the fact that he is in a city where there is no gospel, I would say. And now maybe there's a percentage, some minute percentage, but there may have been some people passing through, but I think the residents of Athens were all just completely uh, lost. Uh, they had you know, no idea about what the real gospel was. They didn't, they didn't know the one true living God. They, they, it says it was full of idols. Uh, idol worship permeated the entire city. It was really what the city was. It, was. it was not a city where there was idolatry. It was a city of idolatry. Does that make sense? It's, it's not that there was a lot of it going on. It was, again, permeating. That, that word in the, in the Greek is uh, katidolos, and it means utterly idolatrous. Utterly, like just totally, it's completely wholly given over to idolatry. So there is such darkness that when he comes into the city, he feels the weight of that. Uh, has anybody ever done that? You ever, you ever came to a place, uh, a location, a building or something like that, and you just kind of feel the darkness, the lostness, the, the heaviness of the spiritual condition of the place? Well, well that's what he says. Uh, the, the writer uh, in Nero's, Nero's court uh, one time said that it was easier to find a God at Athens than a man. Now that, to me, that, that's a great statement for how fully idolatrous, completely given over to idolatry this city was, that one of its own writers said it's easier to find a God in this town than it is to find a man in this town. Uh, and I would remind you of this, and I, I hope maybe some of the younger folks in here would listen to this. Cities, towns are like the opposite sex. No matter how aesthetically beautiful they are on the outside, if Christ is not on the inside, then they're not attractive. There should be no attraction. Um, you've all heard that beauty is only skin deep. 
Um, I'm going to tell you, the ugly goes all the way to the bone. I mean, the ugly goes all the way to the marrow. And without Christ, I want you to hear me, without Christ, we are all hideous because we are sinful. When God looks at you, if he does not see the blood of Christ covering you, he sees wretchedness because he sees your sin. We should, we should really be training our eyes, and parents, we should be training our children to have those kind of eyes, to have those kind of lenses where they don't just see people for the aesthetics, for the, the outward body. Uh, we've, we've mentioned this a few times, but in, in 1 Samuel, Samuel goes to anoint the new king, and he goes and he looks and he sees Jesse's oldest son. He's like, that's a big hoss right there. It's a strapping young man. He must be the next king. And God says, see, that, that's the problem. Man looks on the outside, but I look on the heart. And see, we need to have that same condition. Paul was not looking at the aesthetic beauty of Athens. He was looking at the heart of Athens, and he realized when he was looking at Athens, he was seeing lostness. He was seeing idolatry, complete and total idolatry, a, 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 an utter wretchedness that that city portrayed because of their lack of gospel influence, their lack of Jesus people moving in and among the people and moving in and among the government. It was a completely lost society that was full of every kind of idolatry you can imagine, worshiping every different avenue that you can imagine except the one. Uh, by the way, you know, the world we live in now is fine with you worshiping anything you want to worship unless it's God. You can believe anything you want to believe unless you believe in Jesus. You can believe anything you want to believe unless you believe the Bible. You can, be, you can just say that you are whatever you want to be, and you can be that, and we're supposed to act like you are. We're supposed to change the way we look at you and think about you and what we call you. And, and if you're not careful, if we're not careful, we're going to continue down this road until we're going to be like some of these places where you can be thrown in jail, you can be arrested or fined if you call somebody the wrong gender. But you, you can't believe the Bible. Because if you believe the Bible, that's hate speech. Now think about that. Think about how ridiculous that is at its core, how ludicrous that idea is. You can be, if I want to be a woman, you have to call me she, her but I can't believe the Bible because that's hate speech. But that's the direction we're going, and, and I believe that's kind of where Athens was. I think that the, uh, the, the fact that idolatry had permeated the city meant that there was, there was really no safe space for people to hear the gospel, which is why I believe God sent them there. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce said, Although Athens had long since lost the po political eminence, which was hers in an earlier day, she continued to represent the highest level of culture attained in classic antiquity. So Athens once was a powerful political nation, a, 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 a powerful army. They had lost all of that. But they were still a powerful uh, area of thinkers, philosophers. Uh, imagination ran wild there. So verse 17, he goes to the, to the synagogue as he usually does. But Luke also points out here that he reasoned with the Gentiles in the marketplace. Now, we saw that word in verse 2 where he dialogued, dialogo mahi, where he, uh, this is where we get the word dialogue, to take part in a conversation or discussion to resolve a problem. He goes to this area where he can have this dialogue and he reasons with them. But, but note the difference here. Let me, let, me, let me point this out to you. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. If you go back to verse 2, as usual, Paul went to them, again, to the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and showing that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Now, what's the difference in the two? Verse 2, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, and then in verse 17, he reasoned in the synagogue and in the marketplace. What's the difference? So, so he didn't reason from the scriptures. Yeah, he, he could have said reason from the scriptures to the synagogue, in the, to, the, to the Jews and the God-fearing God Gentiles, but he didn't reason from the scriptures in the marketplace. Why? Because it would have been a futile effort. Again, this is not a religious center. This is a, a, an idolatry center. There is no word here. There is no scripture here. It's all feelings and emotions and live your truth and I'm going to live my truth and live their truth and all that ridiculous junk we have today. There was no sense in bringing the scriptures into the conversation in Athens 
unless he was in the synagogue. And it says he was. He did go to the Jews. He went to the God-fearers, and he reasoned with them. I'm positive that at least some of that, he probably used some scriptural foundation, maybe not as, as much as he would in Thessalonica or somewhere like that, where there was a, an established, you know, it wasn't quite as idolatrous as Athens. But Athens has this darkness to it. And so I don't believe he used much of the scriptures, but he still reasoned with him. How, why? Why would you reason with him? Because reason is what we're going to win people with. I, I want to I be clear about this. Romans 1.16, I'm unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God and salvation for the Jew first and then for the Gentile, for the Greek. We need to understand that the gospel is the power. The gospel is the message. But it's reasoning with someone, not bashing someone, not belittling someone, not condemning someone, not being judgmental and hateful. I'm telling you, the church has been using that effort for 100 years, and it don't work. And if you don't believe me, look at the size of the Southern Baptist Convention 50 years ago and the size of it today. Bashing, berating, belittling does not work. We must be the hands and feet of Christ. Am I saying to compromise the gospel? Listen, if you think that, you, you ain't been around me very much. I am a, I, listen, I am dogmatically gospel-centered if the Bible says it, whether I like it or you like it or they like it, doesn't matter. This is the truth. This is the word of Almighty God. I don't get anywhere, though, trying to cram it down somebody's throat or trying to knock them over the head with it. I'm sorry the gospel hurts your feelings, but it's still the truth. I'm really not sorry because, again, I told you all that's the greatest thing that ever happened to me was that it hurt my feelings. My feelings are lying. Your feelings are lying. We need our feelings hurt. We need our feelings crushed so that we can get rid of our feelings and stop listening to our hearts and we can start listening to the truth of God's word. But we can't beat people over the head with it and expect them to respond. That's not what Paul did. You're going to see a great example of how to gospelize people who don't believe what you believe. And we watch Paul do it. He would use the Old Testament for the audience made up of Jews and god fears, And then we're going to see in detail in the next section how he would find some common ground with Gentile audiences in order to open the door for sharing Christ. You don't open a door for sharing Christ by putting... Uh, Y'all ever seen the little TV shows with the, like the, the uh, SWAT teams and stuff where they put the little explosives on the doors and blow it up? Or they got the little crowbar thing? Or they got that, what's funny to me is they always have this 110-pound female cop that kicks open these doors. I'm like, come on now. You, those people have never been locked out of an apartment in college because I was a good 210, and I couldn't kick one in. So if, if 110 is kicking it in, I want her to give me a class in case I get locked out. But, but that's not how we get the gospel. We don't get the gospel by kicking in a door. We don't get the gospel in by crowbar and, and explosives. We get the gospel in by showing the love of Christ. Again, we, we, we show that there is a hope within us, and then people ask us about that hope, and then we are prepared to give a defense. That's what Peter tells us. Peter says, always be ready to give a defense for the hope that is within you. You have to show that hope so that somebody will ask you about that hope. And when they ask, you be ready to tell them. And by the way, you don't have to just wait for them to ask. You can find opportunities to get it in. Now, I had a, a, an appointment the other day with a new doctor, and, and we're five minutes into the conversation, and I'm already, listen, man, if, if, if I come to see you, your business, I'm, I, got two, I got two motives. <laughs> I'm there to get something from you, and I'm trying to give you Jesus. And so when I get in, I sit down, and we start talking, I'm, I'm, the whole time, man, my radar is up. And the doctor made a comment, and I said, well, what do you think about this? And, and th th sometimes it's as simple as that, opening a, opening a door, starting a conversation. Uh, a lot of times if I'm in a restaurant, I'll ask the, the waitress, uh, hey, can I, is there, I'm going to bless the food in just a minute. Can I pray for something? Is there something that, that I can pray for you about? You'd be amazed how many times. We had one one time, uh, Charles did that one time at a Waffle House, and the girl said, I'm good, and she walked off, and she came back over and started sharing and got emotional sharing about something we prayed for. I've been at, at places I did that, and the, the person would say, man, I'm a follower of Christ too. Uh, you tell me something, let me pray for you too. But there's just opportunities we have, but we don't get it by bashing, belittling, or berating. We get it by showing the love of Christ. Verse 18 talks about the Epicureans and the Stoics. These philosophers in Athens made a challenging dynamic for sharing the gospel because these two groups 
were the primary two groups, and they had their own ideas, and they were very different from Paul's and from each other's. So not only were they in disagreement with Paul, they were in disagreement with each other. Now, the two primary groups are the Epicureans. Excuse me. They followed the teachings of the Greek philosopher Epicurus, who lived from 342 to 270 B.C. They believed that all knowledge was based on experience that came from their own senses. So if you couldn't sense it, taste, see, touch, smell, taste, then, then it wasn't real. They believed that pleasure or happiness was the highest good and the, the, the utmost goal for, the, for, a, for a person's life. Okay, so That's the Epicureans. The Stoics were founded by Zeno of Cyprus, who lived from 335 to 263 B.C. By the way, if you look at this, there's a pretty, pretty good overlap there. And they taught in what was called the stoa, or the porches in public spaces. They asserted that humans must live in harmony with nature, which they believed were the gods, and they believed that reason was the highest good. So Epicureans believed that it was from your senses and getting your own pleasure or happiness. The Stoics believed that reason or intellect, thinking things through, uh, was the highest good, and they did not believe in an afterlife. Now, it's funny to me how you have Pharisees and Sadducees and Epicureans and Stoics, and they're kind of similar. In what, there's, to me, there's just ways where they're kind of similar, and all four of them are missing the point. <laughs> two further than up, two, the, the two Athenian groups are missing the point further than the other two, but they're still missing the point. And by the way, can I tell you this? You don't want to miss heaven by that much. Because if you miss heaven by that much, guess where you end up? Not heaven. There you go. Uh, F.F. Bruce about this says, Stoicism and Epicureanism represented alternative attempts in pre-Christian paganism to come to terms with life, especially in times of uncertainty and hardship. Post-Christian paganism down to our day has not been able to devise anything appreciably better. Now, let me go back and tell you this again. Epicureans believe that all knowledge was based on experience and pleasure or happiness was the goal of life. Everybody with me? Stoics believe they must be in harmony with nature because they worship nature and they believe that reason was the highest good. Can anybody think about our society that we live in, the, the non-Christian society that we live in, they're still basically Epicureans and Stoics. They're either seeking pleasure or they're worshiping nature. Here's my point. Pharisees, Sadducees, Epicureans, Stoics, Mother Earth worshipers and pleasure seekers, they would all tell us that we're crazy for worshiping this God that we believe in while they worship something else. We're not... People are always... Pe people are people, and people gonna people. We, Julie kind of has probably heard me say that a few times. You know, well, something will happen, and she'll tell me, I said, man, people gonna people. You know, what do you say? What do you say about it? You know, we try to help somebody, try to help somebody, try to help somebody, and we find out they've done something stupid. Hey, people gonna people. One thing you count on, people, they're going to people. And whether you're a Pharisee or Sadducee, an Epicurean or a Stoic or whatever modern-day group you find yourself in, the same people who would tell us that religion is a crutch cannot gather together without alcohol. They cannot gather together without rallying around some political group that they're worshiping or some, you know, pleasure thing that they're looking into or what. We are all worshipers. The question is not whether or not you will worship. The question is whether your worship will be properly directed or not. And in Athens, the worship was just misdirected. They were worshiping. <laughs> I mean, it seems like they were worshiping anything that would hold still for a minute. But they were not worshiping properly. Here's, I kind of tried to boil it down to the three views. You have the Epicurean, Stoics, and then Paul, Okay. The Epicurean view was to enjoy life. The Stoic view was to endure life. But Paul points them to eternal life. That should be us today. 
That really should be what we point people to today. Not, 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 I think sometimes we, we try to overcomplicate it. We, we try to get people to go from being lost as a goose to being like holy. Never make a mistake, never, never, you know. That's not how it works. Now, now you are justified when you come to faith in Christ, but you're not, you're not going to live a perfect life. You have to improve. You have to grow in the knowledge and, and grow into being conformed in the image of Christ. You don't get conformed in the image of Christ unless you submit to Christ. And nobody, and I mean nobody, submits every aspect of their life instantaneously. It's a process of sanctification. I said Sunday it was consecration, but it's, it's sanctification is the technical term for it. I didn't clarify that enough. Part of sanctification is becoming consecrated. You know, you are glorified. When you first come to Christ, you're as saved as you're ever going to be. But you're not as right as you're ever going to be. You're not as close to Jesus as you're ever going to be. You're not modeling Jesus as much as you're ever going to do it. You're not conformed when you're justified. You're justified, which means God loves you. He has saved you. He has covered you in the blood of Christ. You are redeemed. And then one day when you die or he returns, you're going to be glorified. You're going to get out of this old flesh suit. You're going to take off this clay vessel and you're going to put on your eternal body and you're going to be perfected. But in the process of getting to that other, from glorification to just, from justification to glorification, that process is arduous. It is, in my experience, filled with peaks and valleys. You are constantly being consecrated, and then you are touching the unclean. You got to be consecrated again, not resaved, but recleaned, not not re-redeemed, but recleaned, so you can be of good use. To the Father, so you can be a good use to the church. You can be a good use to your family, but 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 that process is not always pretty, and it's not instantaneous. Justification is instantaneous. Glorification will be instantaneous. But all that stuff in the middle is sanctification, which is a continual process of consecration until you get into the image of Jesus. I hope to goodness that I'm closer to Jesus right now than I was when I got saved 25 years ago. I hope I am, April. Maybe don't answer that in front of people. Just tell me later. I'm, listen, what I know about my wife is if I wasn't closer, she would be telling me already. But it's a process that we have to under, un, undergo, and, and that's how we need to understand. When you first get somebody to come to Christ, they're not going to know all the lingo. They're not, they're not going to know exactly how to dress in certain situations and circumstances. One of my big pet peeves are people that always hammer on people for how they dress at church. You know, if there should be one place that you don't feel any anxiety about what you're wearing at church, I mean, what you're wearing, it ought to be at church. I, I, I know people. I, I've had conversations with people who said, I can't go to church. I don't have a suit. Seriously? If a suit's keeping you out of church, I, listen, I'll, I'll buy you a suit. But a suit can't keep you out of church. It shouldn't. If you have a church and people don't feel like they can come in your doors without a suit on, you ain't got a church. You've got a glorified Kiwanis club. We've we got to start reaching people where they are, meet them where they are, and try to get them where we want them to be. Try to get them where God wants them to be. But, but don't expect it to be an overnight success. Don't expect them to be in the gutter one day and, and in the boardroom the next. It's, it's not how that happens. They had little respect for Paul at first when he started sharing the good news about Jesus and the re resurrection. To the point that they called him, and I told you we're going to get to this word. This is an interesting word to me. Uh, in, in, the, in the Hallman, it says uh, pseudo-intellectual. Uh, in the CSB, it, it says an ignorant show-off. Here's the literal word, all right? Spermalagos. Spermalagos. Now, that doesn't say anything like that. What does it? Ignorant show-off, uh, Pseudo, it doesn't sound like that, does it? Here's the literal translation of that Greek word. I love this. <laughs> seed picker. Now, Ron has probably been called a pea picker before. <laughs> a seed picker. That's the literal translation of that word. Uh, S-P-E-R-M-O-L-O-G-O-S. Spermologos. A seed picker, like a crow. 
Figuratively, it means one who picks up scraps of knowledge. Uh, Some translations call it a foolish babbler, one who can't make a cohesive, rational argument. So they're calling him a seed picker because he doesn't agree with their philosophies, either the Epicurean or the Stoic point of view. They're mocking him because he's talking about, quote, how do they say it? He seems to be telling the good news about Jesus. Hold on. Oh, here it is. He seems to be a preacher of foreign deities. <laughs> Do y'all understand the concept of deities? <laughs> if you believe as the Epicureans and Stoics did, they're all foreign. You're not a deity. Therefore, they are foreign to you. They're away from you. The comical thing was they accused him of talking about a foreign deity. He is actually talking about the only true deity. And they're ready to miss that because they're too busy wrapped up in their search for sensual pleasures or worshiping nature. They mocked this man who had the keys to life and the keys to eternal life They mocked him because they didn't believe what he said initially. They didn't listen to what he said initially. They didn't do what the Bereans did and say, hey, I don't know what you're talking about, but I want to know more about this. that's, That's my point. When you try to share the gospel with somebody and they reject it, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Christ. Now think about how stupid that makes them sound that they are rejecting the only the only payment for sin. The only one that can redeem them from the sins that they've committed, set them right with a holy God, allow them to get into heaven and out of hell, they reject him. And you're concerned about their opinion of you? I I know I'm beating a a dead horse here. But I'm going to be honest with you. I I, I don't know what's going to get me to not keep saying this when we come about it because this is where I see the biggest problem in the church. The biggest problem in in Christianity today is that we don't have enough people willing to go and tell. And it is the great commission. It's not the great option. It's not a commission of multiple and you pick which one you want to do. It's the last thing Jesus gave us to do. Go make disciples. He says in Acts 1.8, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses. Why? Because you're going to have power. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. You're going to have power, and then you're going to take my gospel everywhere that you go. And if we're honest, most of us live in a neighborhood where we have a neighbor we haven't shared Jesus with. If we're honest, most of us have a coworker, a friend, even a family member that we have not shared Jesus with. And I want you to hear me. As, and I, I'm, not being, I'm not being ugly. I'm not, trying to be, I'm not trying to bash anybody for your little Christmas present. I'm not bringing any lumps of coal. But I just got to tell you the truth. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable that we would not do the one primary job we're given. Again, I tell you, to simplify it, we're told three things. Love God, love others, make disciples. If you want to boil all of the New Testament down to its most basic tenets, that's what we're left here to do. Love God, love others, make disciples. And if we're only doing one of those, we're not doing the other two. Then we're not doing any of the three, to be honest. If, we're, if, we're only, if we only claim to be doing one of those, if we can only check the box that says, oh, I do love God, do you love others? Well, some others. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> He didn't say go love others, some of them, the ones that you don't mind loving, the ones that are lovable. No, if you're not making disciples and loving others, you're not really loving God. That's the message of the gospel. Verses 19 through 21 talk about when he went to the Areopagus. This was a court named for the place that it usually met or that it once met. Literally translated the hill of Ares. Ares was the Greek god of war, and this was uh, the place where they went. It was also called Mars Hill from the Roman god of war. But this was the very center. This was the, the power spot for philosophical discourse in the city. 
This is where people would go to share new ideas, theories, insights, and, and have these debates and these discussions, these dialogues with people. Now, Bob Utley, in talking about this, says this, Here is the difference between intellectual curiosity, which is what we see in verses 20 and 21, and revelation. Okay? They're curious. He says, um, what, may, what you say sounds strange to us, and we want to know what these ideas mean. Revelation <clears throat> is not that. Um, intellectual curiosity is not revelation. So, so Dr. Utley goes on to say this. God has made us curious. I'll read a couple of passages to you from uh, Ecclesiastes. God has made us curious, but human intellect cannot bring peace and joy. Only the gospel can do this. And see, that's the problem with Epicureans and Stoics and Pharisees and Sadducees and whatever half-baked ideas we come up with today for things to worship. None of that stuff can bring you peace. None of that stuff can bring you joy. Only the gospel can bring you peace. Only the gospel can bring you joy. Let me read these for you. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I'm going to read 8 and 9, and then I'll read 18. And this is, again, this is a book written by King Solomon. He says, All things are wearisome more than anyone can say. The eyes not satisfied by seeing, or the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Wisest man who ever lived figured it out, ain't nothing new. Nothing new under the sun. Verse 18, for with much wisdom is much sorrow. As knowledge increases, grief increases. Now, before I read the other passage out of Ecclesiastes 3, why, why do you think that is? I know this is a weird setting for that, for Q&A, but I really feel like we need to... With much wisdom is much sorrow. As knowledge increases, grief increases. Why does Solomon say that, you think? There's a lot of things out there that we don't know about. And if you don't know it, you can't be upset about it. In fact, you probably had to eat a cake like we eat today in the 1800s if you really understand it. You don't know what's going on in the rest of the world. Yeah. If you were in Kansas in the 1800s, you didn't know there was a massive hurricane hitting the Gulf Coast. And you didn't care. Uh, you can boil all of that down, Harold, into ig ignorance is bliss. I can't remember who said it. I'm, that's a quote, but it's been around forever. Ignorance is bliss. But, but with much wisdom is much sorrow. As knowledge increases, grief increases. Anybody else? How about the more you know, the more you figure out that you don't know? Is that, is that accurate? You're like, man, I figured this out. And you go, wait a minute, what's that? <laughs> hey, I figured out what this thing does. Oh, wait, this other thing does some other stuff. I don't know what it does. Theoretical physics is way above my intellectual pay grade, okay? But I, I believe that Theoretical physics is looking for a God that they deny. To me, theoretical physics is one of the most futile, fruitless endeavors that a scientist can take up because they are trying to explain the universe without using the supernatural. That's the reason that I'm not an atheist today is because I could not explain the universe without inserting something supernatural. I tried. Y'all think I, I think sometimes when I throw that out there that I try to be an atheist, I don't have enough faith that people think that's some kind of cliche. It's not. It, it's, it's my testimony. When I was in college, I wanted to be an atheist. I thought, man, all the, all the sharp thinkers, all the cool people, they're all atheists, and I want to be an atheist. And, and so I like, I'm going to look into Big Bang, and I'm going to look into Darwinianism. And, and the more I looked into it, I'm like, you know, you can, you can take the two ends and you can get them almost, but you, you can't quite get them together enough to connect unless you have something supernatural. We crawled out of the primordial ooze as single-celled organisms, and we developed into multi-celled organisms. That doesn't make any sense. Unless, unless something supernatural, it's the old joke about the scientists that all got together and they decided that they knew as much as God, and you know, God created life, and they said, well, we have all this intellect in the building. We could create life. 
so they start getting together and they start thinking. And, and finally, one of them says, well, you know, let's think about how God did it. What, how, what did he start with? They said, well, he started with dirt. And everything got quiet and still and, and like dim. And you hear this voice from heaven says, uh-uh, get your own dirt. See, he created the dust from which he created man. We can't do that. There has to be something supernatural involved for all this stuff to make sense. I think that's partly what Solomon is meaning here. With much wisdom is much sorrow. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And then as knowledge increases, grief increases. The more you learn and know, the more you realize that that's not filling the void. It's a cliche, but everyone, everyone is born with a God-shaped hole in their life. And, and you can fill that, listen, I, I, you try to fill that void with sex, drugs, uh, alcohol, money, fame, popularity, good looks, what, athletic achievements. You can try to, idols and anything, you can fill that void with everything else that you can come, that you can come up with, and it's never going to fit until you fill it with God, and then God fills that void, and you have peace and joy and happiness and hope. Look at Ecclesiastes 3. Verses 10 and 11, again, Solomon writing, says, I have seen the task that God has given the children of Adam to keep them occupied. Now, listen to this. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also put eternity in their hearts, but no one can discover the work God has done from the beginning to end. What, what does that mean? He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has put eternity in their hearts. That's the God-shaped hole. God placed God loved us so much that he gave us free will. But his love didn't stop there. He loved us so much, Danny, that he gave us the, the fix for the virus. If you want to think computers, we were born with a virus. We were born with a computer virus, and that virus grew and grew. And he gave us the fix for that virus. He, 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 he created us with a void that only he could fill, and he created us with a free will to look to try to figure out how to fill it. And then he gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins, to pay our debt, to take our punishment, to give us redemption. And he, he did all of that so that we would, we would have an opportunity to see him as he is. And then he calls, he draws us, he gives us the chance to use our free will to say yes to Jesus. And God, does, he, God has done, is doing, and will do all the work for your salvation. You only have to accept it. That's a good God. And that God fills every void that all of these New Age gods, all of these uh, Athenian gods and all these Old Testament uh, missing the forest for the trees people were looking for. They didn't believe Paul, but they wanted to know more because gaining knowledge through research and debate was the basis of how they operated. The, again, I'm going to go back to this again. The, the brilliance of Paul, he didn't come to them preaching the Torah. They would have dismissed him offhand. We don't know that. That's that Jewish stuff. We don't want to hear it. He didn't. He tried to find common ground. We're, we're going to see that in the next passage. But he found them where they were, and he tried to get them Jesus where they were. The people of the town spent all their time telling or hearing something new. Much of our modern society in America has almost turned into the opposite of this. Now, we are seeking something new, but it's only recycled. You know how many young people are getting their ideas for everything they do in their lives off TikTok and Instagram, Snapchat? You know we had to put a label on Tide Pods because that became a thing because some idiot kid did it on TikTok and a billion people saw it or whatever and everybody's like, ooh, I'm going to do that too. The Tide Pod Challenge. Have you seen the people that get out there? This is a few years ago. The people that would get out of their car and dance with somebody videoing them. You know how many fail videos you've seen of that where people run into poles or get hit by a car or the car runs off in a ditch? But they saw it on TikTok, so they have to do it. We have turned into this society that wants to form an early opinion and then fight tooth and nail to hold on to that opinion in the face of obvious contradictions to that opinion. There are 
272 genders. Nope. I can do what I want. I can love who I want. By the way, the, the biggest problem in our society is that they want to believe in a Jesus, but it's not a Jesus of the Bible. And if it's not the Jesus of the Bible, it ain't Jesus. You can call him Jesus, but he ain't Jesus. The Jesus of the Bible is the only Jesus. The God of the Bible is the only God. But we live in a society that's, that's rejecting religion by holding on to some idiotic opinion religiously. We don't, we don't believe in organized religion. Well, tough break because God did. Sometimes they claim their own version of God without searching the scriptures to see if that version is accurate. I said this a few weeks ago, and I'll say it again. If we, if we form our opinion of God from our emotions, we are just building an idol and calling it God. This is the book. This is the description of who God is and who Jesus is. And if we don't believe this, we don't really believe him. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 tells us about what we need to look for and how we're going to live. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Timothy, uh, Paul writes to young Timothy and he says, but know this, hard times will come in the last days. Now think about how long ago this was written. <laughs> okay, a couple thousand years ago nearly. Hard times are going to come in the last days. Timothy's been dead and gone a long time. He saw this in his day and we are still seeing it now. Why? Because since Jesus ascended, we are living in the last days. And I hate to bust anybody's bubble that likes to read the prophetic books that come out every, you know, uh, 22 reasons why Jesus will return in 2022 and, you know, the mind calendar and all that. By the way, I saw a post of mine from uh, this date of, uh, in 2012. That was what, it was, no, it was from the, the, the 21st, right? Was it, was it 12, 21, 12 was the last day of the mind calendar or something like that? We, we were losing our mind. Remember that? Like, that's been a long time ago. We were losing our minds by then. People were like, oh, it's going to end. Because some Indians out in the Bush, thousands of years ago, ran out of rock. Like, they had old Earl, the rock carving guy, and he, he was like, ran out of rock. Well, I guess that's it. That's a long time in the future. Nobody's going to be here to call me a liar. <laughs> Hard times will come the last days. Now, listen to the descriptor of the people that he will experience. He's telling, Paul is telling Timothy he's going to experience these kind of people in the last days. Do me a favor. If you know somebody like this, when I read one of these descriptors, just raise your hand and keep it up. Will y'all do that for me? Baptists don't like to raise their hand too, by the way. Y'all like, ain't going to hell for raising him. Pentecostals raise it when they walk in the door. They hear the first note. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> It'll be okay. We can learn something. All right, here we go. For people will be lovers of self. <laughs> lovers of money. I'm out of arms already. Boastful. Proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents. <laughs> I, I loosed. <laughs> oh, that got me. <laughs> Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holy mackerel. That's a good one. Holding on to the form of godliness, but denying its power. Here's the kind of people, Timothy, that you're going to run into in the last days. Can I just, if you will allow me to assume the role of Paul, and y'all are going to assume the role of Timothy, I'm going to tell you the same thing. In the last days, times will be hard, and these are the people that you're going to have to deal with. These are the people in your neighborhood, in your neighborhood. It's, but it's not, it's not like the mailman, the postman. It's all these lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful prayer. And, and here's what Paul's example to Timothy, here's what his, his advice to Timothy was and what our advice should be today. Again, not, not, not avoid taking the gospel to them, but avoid them. And what, what does he mean by avoid? Does he mean not take the gospel? Absolutely not. That is your mission field. That is, that is the, that, the, those are the people that you need to be trying to get the gospel to today. Today. You don't want to be on the other side of eternity and look over and watch them going down the old escalator to the heat and think to yourself, I never told them. 
But he says avoid these people. What he means is avoid living like these people. Avoid letting these people permeate your life and avoid letting your life reflect their life. Don't let, don't, don't let them drag you down to their level and beat you with experience. Live in the world but not be of the world. That's what he's trying to tell us to do. See, the Athenians wanted to know stuff, but Christ wants us to know him. See, that's the big disconnect that you find. The Athenian people wanted knowledge. They just didn't want knowledge of Christ. You know why? The very first one, lovers of self. People who are lovers of self and lovers of money don't want any part of Christ. If you ever find anybody who loves themselves and loves, Christ, loves money, they probably don't love Christ. If you see Christ for who he is and see yourself for who you are, that love it only, is only going in one direction. And it's not inward. It better be outward. You better be seeing Christ and loving him. In the end, knowing him is all that's going to matter. And they just didn't get it. Again, they were looking at all these gods. Here God, there God, everywhere God, God. They were wanting to worship anything that moved. One story was, and I didn't put this in my notes, but one story that I read said that um, there was a bunch of sheep. Uh, they, had, they were trying to figure out what was going on, some problem going on. I can't remember all the details. Some plague or, or just some, some kind of drought or pestilence or whatever. And they were trying to figure it out. And so they decided they were going to release these sheep. And wherever these sheep went, that was what was doing it. And they were going to slaughter the sheep and worship that thing. Is that crazy? Can I just tell you, it's no crazier than some of the stuff we see out there today. Some of the stuff people worship today is no crazier than cut loose a bunch of sheep and see where they go and, and worship wherever they stop. Worship whichever shrine they go up to. That's kind of what our society does now. Listen to Paul's letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I got to wonder if he's thinking about Athens when he, wrote, when he writes this letter, right? I, 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 I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. Though Paul could have done that. He was a very brilliant man, a very learned man. Verse 2, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because that's where hope is. Hope rests alone in the personhood of Jesus Christ. The lamb slain before the foundation of the world, the sinless son of God, lived a life you couldn't live, died a death that you deserved so that you could have eternal life with him. John 17, 3, Jesus' words, he said, this is eternal life. Now listen, I've said a bunch of stuff up here tonight. I don't know how much of it is useful. But I'm going to tell you, when, when Jesus speaks, you better lean in. And when Jesus says, this is eternal life, you need to learn this verse. <laughs> you need to really pay attention to what he said. This, he didn't say this is part of eternal life or this is the first step of eternal life. This is one of the many things you need to know to get eternal life. He said, no, this is eternal life. You ready? That they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. This is eternal life, that they will know God and his son Jesus. Everything else is commercials. Everything else is commercials. We got parents who are riding their kids night and day trying to get them into the NFL or Major League Baseball. Got parents night and day riding their kids to get them into the best school, to get them the best degree. They want to be a doctor, a lawyer. They got, they got all these aspirations for what they want their kid to do, and half the time they're not getting their kid anywhere near Jesus. And we got some church people that do that, by the way. There, there, there are parents in churches all over this country right now that are much more concerned about their kid's arm, their kid's 40 time, their kid's jump shot, their kid's uh, position in the band or the, or the dance theater than they are worried about that kid's eternal life and whether or not that kid knows and loves Christ. This is eternal life, that they will know him, the one true God, and know his son, Jesus Christ. We're going to see that the next time we study this in verse 22, 
where Paul goes to the Areopagus and he says, Men of Athens, I see that you're extremely religious. I'm passing through and I observe you even have an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. What you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it. He is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. And he goes in to give them the gospel. And then in verse 28, for in him we live and move and exist as even some of your own poets have said, for we're also his offspring. And what he said to the church at Corinth is what he would say to them. I've come here wanting to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. I want you to know the Jesus that I know. I want you to serve the Jesus that I serve so that you can know the peace and the joy and the hope that only comes through him. Paul's desire for Athens must be our desire for our neighborhood, our community, our city, our state, our country, our world. We should want people to know the Christ that we know and love. We should want people to be able to get access to the same peace and hope and joy that we have through Christ. What a great Christmas present it would be if some of you took the gospel as it is to people as they are. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, thank you that you didn't leave us without hope. Although we had broken fellowship, we had broken the relationship, we had sinned, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, and that's where we were. While we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8 tells us that you showed your love to us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Give us that reminder each day, Lord, that we didn't get right before we got saved. That we didn't deserve Jesus. And that we are now your emissaries. We are your ambassadors. We are the hands and feet of Christ. God, we are living in a modern day Athens. I beg you to help us all desire to be a modern day Paul that we would take the gospel and try to get it to as many people as we can. You have given us spheres of influence, not so that we could have sway over people, not so we could be popular, but so that we could be evangelists. God, help us to do that. Help us to complete the mission that you've left us here to do. God, we pray that you would give us the strength to do that. Thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for this time that we get to lift these prayer needs to you. I pray that you would meet each need uh, according to your riches and glory, that you would meet in each individual, each family on that prayer list uh, where they are, meet them at their point of need, and, and be the God of all grace and comfort. Give them the peace that passes understanding. Minister as only you can, and God, help us to play some role in helping with that. Uh, God, we, just, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you, and we pray that you would give us more um, insights and more opportunities to, to do the work of an evangelist. God, give us a blessed night. Give us a blessed week. Help us as we prepare Sunday to celebrate uh, the, the Christmas Eve service and to have communion that night uh, as we point to the, the day that we've set aside on our calendar to celebrate the birth of the Savior of the world. God, we pray that you would help us live our lives in a way that celebrates him every single day. And we pray this in his strong name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, church.